I don't deserve this. To die like this. I was building a house. Deserves got nothing to do with it. This is over. Hola, comrades. Today's topic of interest, Red Dead Redemption 2. In 2004, an ambitious but awkward game emerged from development hell and was released to decent but not stellar reviews. A strong, classic concept was buried in murky execution, it was quickly forgotten except by Western fans. The early 2000s were a time of great innovation in gaming. The drive toward making games more cinematic accelerated in this period, though it would not reach its apex until the second half of the decade. The color palettes of these new games were more muted, but unlike their successors, they did not worship at the altar of the brown and murky, instead using the new technological specs available to them to craft these vibrant worlds. But the worlds were far from the extent of these games' ambitions. More risky and ambitious titles attempted to tell more engaging and nuanced stories. Some of these were incredibly successful, such as Max Payne, Deus Ex, GTA 3, and Marrowind. Some, of course, were not, and this was one of them. That it became a franchise was an unlikely development. Rockstar decided to give the second tier game a sequel, resulting in, shockingly, one of the greatest games of its era. In a world before Skyrim, before GTA 5, and long before Breath of the Wild, Red Dead Redemption created a sweeping, immense, intensely detailed western open world for players to explore. But unlike the open world games that would succeed it, Red Dead Redemption threads together its open world with a compelling story about honor and justice and redemption and revenge. Even the open world itself does not provide the wish fulfillment of the open worlds that would follow it. Though it's never boring, it is brutal and barren. You're a wanted man, danger always lurks. The tension is not only between outlaws and authorities, or between various bands of outlaws, but also between the declining Wild West and the rise of modernity. All three Red Dead games take place in an era called the Twilight of the West. Red Dead Revolver takes place in the 1880s. Red Dead Redemption 2 takes place at the turn of the century, and the original Red Dead Redemption takes place in the 1910s. This was an era where the traditional systems of law and justice that governed the Wild West during its golden years, usually meaning from the 1830s and 40s to the 1870s, began to be replaced by more modern systems of governance. From 1876, when my home state, Colorado, was admitted to the Union, to 1912, when the last state in the continental United States, Arizona, was admitted, the frontier land was tamed and domesticated. In 1890, the United States Census Bureau made a famous proclamation that the frontier had vanished. This meant that there were enough pockets of population scattered throughout the West that there was no longer a conceivable frontier line. The Westerns that take place during this period, including the three Red Dead games, are usually anti-Westerns, also known as revisionist Westerns, whereas the traditional Western features a straightforward, black-and-white sense of morality, the anti-Western dabbles in more morally gray areas. Whereas the traditional Western features an unflappable protagonist, the anti-Western features a weary protagonist dogged by aching loneliness and questions of morality. This does not mean the classic Western protagonist never commits brutal acts. Rather, it means that the Western judges their acts as necessary and just. 
Likewise, the anti-Western protagonist has traits of the traditional Western protagonist, but these traits are buried under layers of stress and sorrow. Many of the protagonists in anti-Westerns could have been traditionally heroic protagonists in standard Westerns. Some of them even were these traditionally heroic protagonists in their younger days, such as Sheriff Bell in No Country for Old Men. These protagonists are left behind. The West no longer resembles the place they knew. They played an integral part in taming the West, but now that the West is tamed, it doesn't need them anymore. They are pushed to the margins. The difference between good guys and bad guys is less notable and important than the difference between the wild and the developed. Both the sheriffs and the old-fashioned criminals those sheriffs chased have been made antiquated more unites them than divides them. Criminals have often become beaten down and weary. They've moved on from their life of crime, whether through choice or necessity. They're no longer in danger, but they're lonely and despairing. The sheriffs are treated better by polite society, but they're still considered dinosaurs. With the decline of the frontier, both sides of the classical western dichotomy lose their identity. Yet these sheriffs and outlaws are not alone in their identity crises. Rather, their situations are merely particularly overt versions of a malaise that spread through America during the first Gilded Age. Frederick Jackson Turner's influential frontier thesis argued that the character of America was forged not in the East, with all its European influences and high culture, but in the rugged, individualistic West where settlers fought against harsh conditions to bring order to chaos and society to wilderness. This is a simplistic hypothesis at best. It has touches of American exceptionalism to it, and it completely ignores race, class, and gender. It also overstates the difference between America and Europe. But there is at least a grain of truth to it, and during the first half of the 20th century, it was taught as gospel throughout American schools, even at the university level. America was heavily defined in its early years by its push westward. So when that push westward was no longer possible, a certain cultural melancholy developed. This was, of course, exacerbated by the overwhelming concentration of wealth in the hands of the likes of Rockefeller, Carnegie, and Morgan, the imposition of racist Jim Crow laws on the southern states that led to millions of African Americans migrating northward, and the bubbling push towards women's rights that led to female suffrage. A push that was most immediately effective in the West, where the traditional social structures that governed America were less overwhelming. But even isolated from these factors, the disappearance of the frontier was accompanied by the disappearance of much of the ethos that sustained America throughout its first century of existence. The country searched for a replacement and found it too. The first was in the preservation of natural wonderlands through the creation of national parks and monuments, a system that started during the Golden Age of the West, but was not transformed into its current state until Woodrow Wilson officially created the National Park Service in 1916 and FDR consolidated the system in 1933. The other replacement was culture. By this point, America had existed for long enough that it had developed a history worth romanticizing. And romanticize its history, America did. Books were part of this, but movies played a larger role. The art of cinema may have been invented in France, but America turned it into a culture-producing machine. The golden age of Hollywood made the United States the dominant cultural power in the world. And it also allowed the country the opportunity to transform its history into mass entertainment. For a new generation of Americans that grew up after the death of the American frontier, their experience with the Wild West was not firsthand, but rather on the silver screen. And the version of the West that they experienced was not the recently passed Twilight of the West in its nuanced, morally complicated, dark glow, or even the more idealistic Golden Age of the West that had preceded it. Instead, the version they experienced was more akin to the material that permeated the cheap adventure stories written during the Golden Age of the West and distributed not only to Easterners, but also to Europeans. That these idealized cinematic narratives about the West emanated from California is ironic, considering that less than a century ago, California was the West. These romanticized stories would have struck Californians as hollow and false just generations prior, but the new generation of Californians that had never experienced the actual West was transfixed by these films. Not until confidence in the traditional and uplifting view of American history was shaken by the tumult of the 1960s and 70s did we begin to get revisionist, cynical westerns that shattered the dichotomy that had dominated the genre. 
in the most archetypical anti-Western, Unforgiven, Clint Eastwood, most famous for his roles as grizzled but heroic protagonists in traditional westerns, plays a gunslinger who has retired to a simple, if lonely, life, but is forced back into the world he left behind because he has failed financially in his post-outlaw life and is worried enough about the future of his children that he seeks a thousand dollar bounty. There are no heroes in this film. Eastwood's money is disdainful and abrasive and bitter, but the sheriff that is his enemy, Little Bill, cares more about maintaining his own despotic grip on the town than ensuring that justice is delivered. This is not a film that evokes support for the views of any of its characters, but it is a film that evokes intense pathos for the positions of Money and his comrades. That decisive, flooding pathos courses through the best anti-westerns, including Red Dead Redemption. John Marston was far from a heroic person, but he was also manipulated by the authorities into tracking down the people he worked with, and none of his work for the authorities helped him in the end because Agent Ross tracked him down and killed him at his farm, like is the case with money. The amorality of Marston's past life does not matter. Far more important is that he left that life behind only to be dragged back into it by forces he cannot control as a result of a rapidly changing world. Red Dead Redemption 2 also succeeds by evoking empathy for an anguished protagonist trapped in a morally gray situation. The Twilight of the West matters because it minimized the distinction between sheriffs and outlaws. Their era was over, and they were bound together by obsolescence. It was a bittersweet farewell. The Wild West was replaced by a more prosperous and successful American West. The transformation was for the better, but that does not mean that much was not lost. Not only the entire system of law and governance, but the entire ethos was eradicated, forcing America to deal with the fact that a key component of its DNA had disappeared, and of the fact that this disappearance had not only left sheriffs and outlaws unsure of their identities, but had also left it unsure of its national identity. While westerns have been made and admired around the world, the genre remains tied to American history, just as the samurai genre remains tied to Japanese history. The best films in the genre embrace this. The Wild West is not only an element of America's past, it is also an element of America's conception of itself. Thus, how an American filmmaker crafts a western reflects their perception of their national mythology. The difference between a critical revisionist western and a traditional idealistic western is not a dry clash of views over a period in history that ended over a century ago, but rather a fundamental difference in worldview. Is the past of America something to celebrate, as Turner believed, or is it something fundamentally broken that needs to be drastically improved upon? Anyway, if you liked what you saw today, consider donating to my Patreon so I can produce even more deserty, wilderness-y content. Also, don't forget to like, comment, subscribe, all that modern stuff. Adios, comrades!